Church, how are we this morning? Amen. Amen. Well, what a blessing this weekend has been. It's always exciting to get to baptize as we did last night in church. Last night, I just want you to know, if you don't have plans on Saturday evening, you're not going to spoil it by coming twice on a weekend. God did amazing things last night. He showed up in a mighty way. And church, we had church last night. We had church last night. I came in and I was kind of iffy on the message. I wasn't, it wasn't the most excited I'd ever been to preach. And man, God just showed up and God spoke. And we're just praying he does the same thing this morning. And I'm confident that he will. Because in Romans chapter 4, it says the word of God is living and active. The word of God is living and active. Which means today we come in not simply to reflect on something that has happened. But we come in with hope that something can happen. And something will happen. Because the word that we're going to read today and the word that we're going to hear today and the word that I'm going to speak today is alive. And it's alive because its author, Jesus Christ, is alive this morning. And as we hear his word and as we tune in to what he says, we get to commune with him this morning. We get to spend time with and experience Jesus this morning. I wonder if we can open up this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be in the series called Uh, best for last. It's an idea that the Holy Spirit is a gift that's been given to each Christian by God specifically to empower us to do the mission that God has for us. The idea is that the best days are ahead for us because the Jesus who rose from the dead for us sent his spirit to live in us to equip us to do the job that he wants us to do in the world today. If you're hearing my voice this morning, I want you to understand before we even jump into the scripture that Jesus Christ loves you, that God loves you so much that he sent his son into the world to die for you. And you may not even know this, but that needed to happen because the Bible says that the wages or the price that we pay for our sin is death. All of us are in this place this morning, sinners. None of us are perfect. None of us have it figured out. None of us have been able to win the battle against sin on our own. Therefore, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world who lived the same life we live today with all the troubles and all the temptations and all the problems and all the political issues. Jesus came and he lived through it and he did it perfectly. And he lived perfectly and he died perfectly and he rose again and he's alive today so that people like you and me can leave this place alive and not dead. See, some of us this morning have come into this place and we're alive. Our bodies are alive physically, but our spirit is dead. Our souls are dead. And you can know this if you live a hopeless life. If you come into this place this morning and you're hopeless and you're lonely and you're depressed and you aren't looking forward to the future because there's nothing good to look forward to and your life has just been trouble after trouble after trouble, I want you to know something. We are so glad you're here this morning because we don't believe church is a place where you should come so that you can leave feeling guilty and feeling bad about your life, and feeling bad about your future. We are excited because when we open up God's word, we have hope that it's alive, that it's living and active, and it can bring that life into us. And we can leave this morning with hope. And specifically, I want to talk about what that life that comes and lives inside of us looks like. You see, Jesus left us with a gift. When Jesus ascended into heaven about a month and a half after his death, he told his disciples that he was leaving them not as orphans, He wasn't going to leave them alone to try to do this life on their own, but that he was going to send them the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that that Holy Spirit that he sent to us is the same spirit that raised him from the dead. And he told them that they were going to be his witnesses, that they were going to be the tools that he was going to use in the world to begin to plant the church and to grow the church. But he wanted them to wait until they had received the Holy Spirit. And if you read through the book of Acts, you find that when these disciples received the Holy Spirit and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, that they had been gifted by the Holy Spirit to do things that they could not previously do. And my hope today is that as we talk about that gifting, my hope today is that every one of us leaves this place this morning Maybe not having identified every specific way in which we are gifted, but instead that we recognize as a church this morning that you and I, if we are Christians, if we know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we leave this place encouraged and hopeful because that means that God has gifted you and he's gifted me 
to do miraculous things in this world in his name. Amen? You see, Jesus told those disciples that when he left, it was going to be for their benefit. He told those disciples that when he ascended into heaven and left them on earth to do this work without him physically present, he told them that it was going to be for their good and that they would accomplish things that he had not accomplished here on earth. And I don't think they believed it. In church this morning, as I bring you this message, as we get ready to open 1 Corinthians chapter 12, one of the reasons I wanted to preach this sermon series is because I think truthfully, we struggle to believe that too. What do you think? When Jesus said that you and I will do even greater things than he did, I think we look at that and we think, man, that sounds good. That sounds awesome, but I'm just not sure I believe that's true for me because I'm not very gifted. You see, we live in a world today, church, that worships and exalts gifting. We live in a culture today that tells you that in order for you to have value and importance in your life, that in order for you to have meaning, in order for you to be a person of importance, in order for you to have self-confidence, in order for you to be a person full of hope and excitement, that you need to look a certain way, and you need to act a certain way, and you need to believe a certain way, and you need to behave a certain way, and you need to exhibit special gifts and special talents that people will lift you up for. We live in a country today that worships gifts. We exalt and worship giftedness. If you don't believe me, I want you to think about something. Our culture has decided that professional athletes are worth millions of dollars per year. Did you know that in our culture... An NFL quarterback signed a 10-year, $500 million contract to throw a football. Did y'all know that? That happened within the last three weeks. And yet our teachers and our police officers and our public workers and our first responders get paid barely enough to survive on. And we do that as a culture, not to condemn those who are gifted. I'm not condemning football players, all right? I'll probably watch it at some point, too. But I say that because our culture has decided that the greatest value is not found in integrity. The greatest value is not found in consistency. The greatest value is not found in Christian holiness. But we've decided that the greatest value is found in those who can entertain us. The greatest value is found in those that we can most easily consume. If you don't believe me, get on Instagram and look at how Instagram follower, or Instagram, uh, what do they call those people? They're, you're an Instagram influencer. See, I'm already too old to be out of the, out of the picture now. Into my mid-30s, it's already passed me by. All I can figure out is Facebook. I don't know the new stuff. But I know this, that in our culture today, the goal is to become an influencer. The goal is to be followed. The goal is to be lifted up. And our culture worships that. Our culture worships those gifts. And the problem in the church is twofold. The problem in the church is twofold. I want to tell you two consequences of this cultural obsession with gifting. Number one, there are many people who call themselves Christians, who are Christians. There are many people who have been saved and redeemed by Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God has come to live within them. And yet they walk around feeling as if they have very little value or meaning. Because the world does not deem them influencers. Perhaps you don't have an external gifting or a talent that people gravitate towards. Perhaps you don't have the look that everybody compliments you for. Perhaps you don't have the financial means or the financial ability to be an influencer or to be part of the crowd that the world tells you you need to be a part of. I stand before you today and tell you that if Jesus be for you, it doesn't matter who is against you or who follows you or who doesn't. I stand before you today and tell you that our cultural worship of external gifting has no bearing on what Jesus thinks of you today. You see, if you're in this place hearing my voice, Jesus is in love with you. Jesus is seeking you. And he is not only seeking you so that you will follow him. He is seeking you and he is after you because he wants to gift you in supernatural ways to be used in his kingdom in ways that you never thought possible. He wants to use you in ways that the world would tell you would be impossible. You see, there is a future greater for you than this world could ever give you. 
There is a plan for you that is bigger in scope and bigger in magnitude than this world has for you. There is no career. There is no social standing. There is no financial standing that can ever give you the longing in your heart that Jesus Christ alone can fill. That's the first thing. The second thing that I see that our cultural obsession with gifting has on the church is this. Because our culture loves to recognize external gifts that we can identify and lift them up and consume them, in the American church, we have run into a situation by which the churches in America today that are not filled with the most gifted and talented preachers and musicians are dying. You see, in America today, the small country church, how many of you all grew up in a little country church? I got any little country church folks? You see, in America today, the little country church is struggling to survive. This morning, my dad, I, I talked to him a couple weeks ago. My dad is going to a church, and there's about two or three families that are going there. And he tells me that nothing has happened in this church in years, that it's been the same week after week. And I say, well, dad, why do you keep going? He says, because if we don't go, the lights don't stay on. You see, the little country church in America is struggling to survive today. Yet in America, the mega church. With all the money and all the lights and all the sound and all the production and all the polish and all the gifting, so to speak, is growing at an exponential rate. And it's getting to the point where if we don't have the music that we like and we don't have the look that I like and we don't have the sound that I like and I don't resonate with that preacher and that's not the style that I like or they don't use the version of the Bible that I like, we've gotten to a place where our senses have been so dulled by our consumption of earthly gifting that we now want the church to look like the world. And we want the church to entertain us the way the world entertains us. And, and listen, I'm not condemning mega churches. If the church gets big, praise God. I'm not condemning a big church. What I am condemning is a cultural viewpoint from the Christian world that says that church is here for me and about me. To entertain me and to comfort me. You see, church is not about the emotional high that we get when everything looks and sounds and feels exactly like we want it to. Church is what happens when Jesus Christ takes a regular person like me and transforms me. It's what happens when Jesus Christ comes into your life and transforms you and changes you. And when we get together and we share together in what Jesus Christ has done, we get excited about that. And we start inviting other people in and we say, listen, you need to come hear this person's testimony. You need to come see what God is doing. And as God continues to work through regular people like you and me, other regular people who are struggling with their life and with their lack of giftedness, they look at that and go, man, if God can use regular people like them, I wonder if he could use me too. And people want to be a part of that. You see, what Metropolis needs, church is not a church that looks, sounds, and acts like the world that will attract them in. What Metropolis needs is for regular people like you and me to be transformed by the supernatural God in a supernatural way, in a way that makes the world curious about how regular people like us could display the gifts that we would ne never otherwise have. I want to talk to you this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to talk about spiritual gifting. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12:1. Concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. He says, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be uninformed. Paul is writing to a church that has problems. You think our church has any problems? Dave, does our church have problems? One or two. One or two. But he's getting older. He's going to retire eventually, so it'll get better. Okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's two weeks in a row I've taken a bad shot. I shouldn't have done that. We love Pastor Brian. There's a, it doesn't sound like it. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pastor Brian always says that my sarcasm is my anger leaking out. He may be right, okay? Our church is not perfect. Our church has a couple of problems. In fact, if you stick with us for a little while and you get plugged into our church, chances are you're going to look around and go, hey, wait a minute. This isn't exactly right. This isn't perfect. And you're right. And Paul wants us to understand, number one, that there is no perfect church. And I was, was it Adrian Rogers who said that if you ever find a perfect church, he's passed on now, but I think it was Adrian Rogers, great pastor, who said, if you ever find a perfect church, don't go, because you'll screw it up. <laughs> and I think that's true. I think that's true. 
You may look around and say, you know what? This church is not perfect. And this church isn't perfect. But this church is seeking after God. And the same can be said for the church in Corinth. Paul is writing a letter to this church. And this church had a lot of problems. But this church was really curious and wanted to know about spiritual gifts. Because Paul had made allusions to this idea that when people get saved, people like them in the past and people like you and me today, when Jesus Christ comes into our life, Paul had made allusion to the fact that we are not only given the Holy Spirit to live inside of us to be our helper, but we are given the Holy Spirit specifically and are gifted in specific ways to do the work of the ministry. And Paul was writing to them about that. And he said, hey, listen, concerning spiritual gifts, you don't need to be uninformed. That tells me that there are things about spiritual gifts that are easy to miss. There are things about spiritual gifts that are easy to miss. And that's where we want to key in today. I want to skip down to verse 4. He said, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So let's look right here for just a second. How many gifts are there? Varieties. That's the number. Varieties of gifts. If you get, in, if you get on Google and you, and you just Google spiritual gifts, what you'll find is that some people believe that the New Testament lists 16 gifts. Some believe it's 12. Others believe that it's really broken down into just four main ones. And most people, like me, we really don't know. In fact, I would go so far as to tell you that I don't believe the goal in spiritual gifting is to understand exactly what gifts you and I have and do not have. And I'll tell you why I believe that's the case. I don't believe that we are gifted in such a way that we only get one or two gifts and that's all we ever get. I believe that the Holy Spirit gifts us in ways that when we put ourselves in situations where we need his gifting, he will gift us. Does that make sense? The idea isn't to know what gifts you have and don't have. For example, if you walk out of here and you say, well, I know I'm not a preacher and I know I'm not a singer, so I must be a nursery worker. Praise God, we need nursery workers. But I don't, amen, preach the word, Miss Robin says. But I don't want you to walk out of this place believing that, well, I've only got one gift and this church doesn't need that gift. Therefore, I don't have a use here. I don't have a place here. We believe that the gifting is less about which gifts we have and don't have. And it's more about understanding some key things about the giftings. Number one, if you look in this verse, in verse four, it says there are varieties of gifts, there are varieties of service, and there are varieties of activities. There are multiple ways in which we are gifted. But also look at this. Gifts, service, and activities are all listed one after another. Do you see it? Paul says, hey, don't be ignorant about this. I want you to know about spiritual gifts. There are varieties of gifts. There are varieties of service. There are varieties of activities. It's almost as if he is putting gifts and service together. It's almost as if he is listing the idea that our activity and our service is the place where we discover our gifting. Not only is he making that comparison, not only is he linking these together, but he is also making very clear that they all come from one place, and that is God. You see, we worship not the gift, but the giver. The difference between the church and the world is that when we recognize good things in a person, we give glory to God for that, and we don't lift that person up and put them on a pedestal. You see, if you leave this place today and you say, man, that music was good. We're glad you enjoyed it, but listen, the goal is not the music. You can find music anywhere. Maybe not good music. I listen to the radio and I don't understand most of it, but you can find music anywhere, okay? The goal today is not that we give you good music. The goal today is that we lead you to the giver. If you leave this place today and you say, man, that preaching was good. I appreciate that and I hope you feel that way. But the goal is not to present you with a preacher. The goal is to present you with the words that God wants to speak through the preacher. You see, gifts and service and activities are not ends in and of themselves. These gifts and these service and these activities are all given by God. And look what he says. It is the same God who empowers them in who? It is the same God who empowers them in the elders and the preachers, the worship leaders, 
Those who were good looking, those who were gifted and talented, those who were born with talents and abilities that are supernatural. No, he says that it is the same God who empowers these gifts and these services and these activities in everyone. Church, hear this today. Every Christian is gifted by the Holy Spirit. Every single Christian is gifted by the Holy Spirit. More than once, we've asked you to raise your hand if you're a Christian. Raise your hand if you're a Christian today. Don't be ashamed of it. If your hand's not up, we want you to be a Christian. We believe it's the best decision you can ever make. And for you Christians in the room, I want you to understand today that Paul's goal is not that we would identify our specific gifts, but rather we would understand that, number one, it is God who gifts, and number two, God gives his gifts to all his children. He gives his gifts to all his children. You see, he loves all of us. And I believe that he loves all of us equally. I don't believe God looks down on the preachers and says, man, I love those preachers even more, so I'm going to gift them specially. I believe that if you are a child of God, that he has set his love upon you and that he has gifted you just as supernaturally as he's gifted me or he's gifted Pastor Brian or he's gifted Miss Carissa. We believe that God's gifts are for everyone who will call upon the name of the Lord. All right. They are for every Christian. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. These gifts are for every Christian. And here's where we're really going to get into the gifts. These spiritual gifts are expressions of faith that strengthen and encourage others. You see, if we want to decide that we want to know how we are gifted, we do not need to get introspective and look at ourselves. I'll tell you a story. I, I grew up in an old Southern Baptist church, and our church grew. It got really, really big. It went from about this size to about seven or 800 people by the time I graduated high school. It just grew massively. And as it grew, they handed out these tests. Have any of you all ever seen these tests? They're like spiritual gifting tests. Okay, yeah, some other country, country church people took this too. They're these printout tests, and you answer these questions, you fill in little dots. It's a lot like taking the ACT, but a little bit more fun. You fill in these dots, and at the end of it, it tells you what spiritual gifts you have. And I remember I was about 16 years old, and I was taking this test, and I was taking this test with my girlfriend. I didn't really want to do it, but she wanted to do it. She was all curious, because don't we love knowing more about ourselves? See, I know we love knowing more about ourselves, because I see some of these quiz results that you people post on Facebook. All right, if you need to know what type of zoo animal you are, that's fine, but I don't need to know what type of zoo animal you are. All right. We love knowing more about ourselves. So she wanted to take these tests and, and we were sitting there, we're taking them. And at the end of it, it lists what spiritual gifts that you've got. I don't really even remember what mine says, but I remember that she was all excited because it told her that she had the gift of prophecy. And even as a 16 year old, I just thought that's weird. <laughs> there, there ain't no way. There's no way. But she believed it. She was convinced that she had the gift of prophecy. And it got to the point where she believed that she could tell what I was going to do or think before I even did it or thought it. That relationship didn't work out. All right. I jumped out of that thing. Praise God that he sent me Miss Carissa. Okay. She's a sweet girl. But you'd think if she had the gift of prophecy, she would have seen that coming. All right. Bad joke. I'm sorry. Good joke. All right. Thank you, Ash. You see, spiritual gifts are not about learning more about myself. Spiritual gifts are not knowing more about me. Spiritual gifts are about other people. And if we are going to become a church full of people who are living out the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us, it's going to start when we recognize that church and the Christian life is not about me primarily. You see, God did love me and God did save me. Amen? And God does love you. There is an aspect in which God loves you specifically and sent Jesus for you specifically. But understand this. The Christian life does not begin and end with me. And it does not begin and end with you. We will come to understand our gifting in the context of the church. You see, spiritual gifts are not talents to be discovered, but they are actions to be taken. They're not talents to be discovered, but they are actions to be taken. If you want to know exactly how the Spirit has gifted you, here's my advice. Get plugged into a church, number one. Amen? On Wednesday nights, we've been doing a series called Next Steps, and we want to invite you to that. We meet at 6.30 on Wednesday nights. The adults meet right here in the sanctuary, and we have been going through a series talking about how we can grow and take our next step as Christians. 
Step number one is being saved. Step number two is being baptized. Step number three, we believe is very important, we join a church. And we become part of a church family. Now, if you've got a church family that you belong to and you're plugged into and you're active, we think that's fantastic. And we want to encourage you to continue doing that. But if you're in this place this morning and you don't have a church home, you don't really have a church family that you call home, we want to invite you and encourage you to get plugged into this one. Because God is moving here. This is a people that God is moving within. And understand that as you get plugged into a church, and as you begin to look around and see those imperfections, or maybe we'll put it this way, as you look around and you see opportunities, you look around and you say, man, you know what could be better at this church? Is this thing over here. We need a ministry for X. Or we need another worker for why. Or man, I would love to be part of a team that does this. Chances are God has gifted you in that area. And that recognition of that need is God's way of telling you, hey, if you want to jump into that, I will equip you to do that. You see, we have a joke in our church. Don't ever give Pastor Brian an idea about the church. And some of y'all know why, don't you? You see, if you come to Pastor Brian and you say, Pastor Brian, I've got an idea for something we could do at the church. If you tell him, you are now leading that thing, whatever it is. If you tell him, he will. I didn't expect that to get an applause. They might like you more than I thought they did. If you be careful, that's why I'm on, I'm on holy ground this morning. If you see a need, that may very well be God's equipping of you. And let me tell you about spiritual gifts. They will stretch you beyond your own capacity. If you sit and you wait for God to equip you to do a ministry that he has not presented with you yet, I would submit to you that you'll be sitting and waiting for a long time. And I'll even go so far as to say it like this. If church for you is an event that you come to and a seat that you sit in and content that you consume, and then you go home and wonder why there isn't more to the Christian life than this, I would submit to you that God this morning is calling you and awakening you to the fact that church was never meant to be an event that we attend. Church was never meant to be content that we consume. Church was never meant to be about that seat that you sit in. We're so glad that you're sitting in it. But if you really want to see the life of Jesus Christ awakened in you, and you want to see the gifting of the Holy Spirit come alive in you, and you want to be used by God, it's going to take a step of faith on your part to take action where you may not yet feel equipped. Let me give you an example. You may be asked at some point to participate in a ministry that you don't feel ready for. A few years ago, I guess it was a couple years ago, we had a need in our children's ministry. And as we looked around the room and decided who was going to help lead the children's ministry, I guess it got figured out that half the children's ministry was my children. (laughs) When you got that many of them, it really becomes a ministry in and of itself. So the idea was put forward. Hey, Pastor Blake, most of these kids are yours anyway. Why don't you and your wife lead the children's ministry? I will tell you that is not what I was looking for. That is not what I was excited to be doing. Yet we agreed to do it, not because I felt equipped, but because I saw a need. And as I saw that need and was willing to fill that need, God gifted me to meet the need that needed to be filled. That is spiritual gifting. That is a supernatural gifting that comes from God to meet need. But it took my willingness to take action. I ask you this morning, are you willing to take action where there are needs? Do we live in a community today that is full of needs? Y'all answer. Do we live in a community that has needs? Yes or no? Church Metropolis is a needy community. Would you agree with me when I say that Metropolis needs a church that is ready to take action? You see, this morning... If we experience great music and great preaching, praise God. But if that's all that this church is, we're not really helping our community. It's about us. But if we leave this place today excited and encouraged and motivated and most importantly, ready to do what the word of God tells us to do, then we can go out into the community and we can affect change. That is where you'll find your gifting. That is where you will see spiritual gifts come alive in you. And I want to take a moment. Just kind of as a, I'm going to take a rabbit, uh, chase a rabbit here for just a second, all right? 
I want to go ahead and answer something. I did this last night. I want to do it today because I want to make clear. There are different churches that believe different things about spiritual gifts. And if you'll notice this morning, we did not go down through the list. There's lots of different gifts. There's the gift of prophecy. Um, there's the gift of exhortation. There's the gift of service. There's all these different gifts. And some of these gifts are supernatural in their essence. Some of you may have grown up in a church that exhibited some of these supernatural giftings. Sometimes these supernatural gifts are abused and it's not really of the spirit. And other times it may be real. Here's what we believe as a leadership team about these supernatural gifts. There are churches that believe they are no longer in effect or in use today. And there are churches that believe that they are still for today. At Eastland Life Church, as a general rule, we are not in the business of telling God what he can and can't do. Here's what I mean by that. If God wants to do something supernatural, we believe he's done it before. We believe he can do it again. Okay? If God wants to gift a believer in a supernatural way, we are not going to look back at God and say, but God, we believe. No, we're simply going to say, God, you're the giver. And we worship the giver, not the gifts. We believe that these gifts have not ceased. I believe that these gifts are still in effect today. But here's specifically what I believe about them. I believe that the gifts that are supernatural in nature will be used by God when Christians step out in faith and move into a place where supernatural gifting is necessary for the spread of the gospel. Okay? I believe that God will do supernatural things when his children exhibit supernatural faith. When we move into a place where we need God to do supernatural things, we believe he will. Church, we believe in healing. We've seen it. Church... Our church is active in missions. And there is an aspect of missions where there are people who will hear and receive the gospel even when there's a language barrier. We believe that happens. But we believe it's for the good of people, not for the good of us. And it's for God's glory, not our glory. Okay? That's what we believe about those things. Now I want to talk about fit for just a second and we're going to get done. Supernatural gifts are actions to be taken, not talents to be discovered. But something I want us to look at today is that supernatural gifts, and not even just supernatural gifts, but spiritual gifts are miraculous, not in their function, not in what they do, but in how they fit together. Let's look at the scripture this way. Paul says in Romans, he says, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually Members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, if the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Look at the picture that we get here. We see the first thing in 1 Corinthians 12. Our gifts are valuable not because of how they look, not because of how they sound, and not because of how they make us feel. Our gifts are valuable in how they fit together with the church. Okay? I want to tell you a story. Back in the early 2000s, there was a basketball player by the name of Shaquille O'Neal. Y'all know Shaq? He's hard to miss. He's like seven foot two, about 900 pounds. He's a big boy. Now, at the time... He played for the Los Angeles Lakers, and he weighed about 360 pounds. Still not a tiny fella. Still not a tiny fella. Big dude. Probably the most dominant player in the NBA at that time. And in the early 2000s, his team, the Los Angeles Lakers, had won three straight NBA championships in dominant fashion. Nobody was really even competing with them. But in the offseason, after their third straight championship, he sustained an injury. And because Shaquille O'Neal got injured and the injury continued to plague his body going into the next season as they chased their fourth straight championship, their team was not nearly as good. Shaq could not get out onto the floor and when he got onto the floor, his minutes were restricted, his movement was restricted, he couldn't play like he could before, he couldn't run like he could before and the team finished that year the sixth best team in the NBA. They never got close to reaching their potential. Because of Shaquille O'Neal's injury. Who knows what his injury was? Anybody remember? He had injured his pinky toe. His pinky toe. Ten toes on this man's massive body. And the tiniest of them was injured. 
his pinky toe was injured, and because one out of his ten toes were injured, his entire team suffered. Because one toe on one man was injured, all the rest of the team was not able to make up for the loss in production from one man due to one toe on one foot. It's amazing what an impact this had. It was literally the tiniest, most insignificant member of the body that had caused this problem. And yet it derailed the team from completing its mission. Church, I believe today that we are often guilty of lifting up preachers and evangelists and prophets and musicians and worship leaders and buildings and lights and sounds and ministry. And we believe that if we can get the right preacher... And we can get the right building and we can get the right look and we can get the right sound that we can accomplish our goals. But I would submit to you that there is more value in one Christian recognizing their gifting and getting plugged in and into the game than there is in any number of ministries that we can try to dress up. You see, I believe today that the thing that is going to keep Eastland Life Church from accomplishing our mission of reaching, teaching, coaching, and leading people is not the preachers. Now, I have a responsibility to exercise my gifting, no doubt, as does Pastor Brian, as does the rest of our elder team. But church, we don't need more of me to reach this community. Praise God. Y'all get enough. God bless you. We don't need more of Pastor Brian. Metropolis does not need more of what we're already doing. Let me tell you what our church and our community needs to be successful. We need you. You may feel insignificant. You may be in this place this morning saying, you know, I can't preach. I'm not really a teacher. In fact, I don't really even like to talk in front of people. The old joke says it like this. They say that the greatest fear in America, y'all know what it is? It's public speaking. Number two is death. They say that you would rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. There are some people that are scared to death to get in front of people and speak. You may be out there this morning thinking to yourself that you do not have the ability to play an instrument. You don't have the ability to work the technology. You don't have the ability to do some of these things that you can see right now externally. I want you to know today that God is not looking for you to be a carbon copy of somebody else. God is gifting you supernaturally and spiritually to do something only you can do. And if you want to see revival happen in Metropolis, is that something we want? We want to see Metropolis. I don't, I don't want to hear about Metropolis anymore. I get on social media and I hear the way people run down our town. As if it's hopeless, as if there's nothing that can be done, as if there's nothing good. Church, I know there's something good happening in this town because every weekend that I come into this building and I gather with God's people, I get filled with hope because old people, young people, middle-aged people are getting saved, are getting baptized, are worshiping, are getting wound up about what God is doing. And I think to myself, hey, we're sending these people out into the community. Metropolis is going to see some good things happen because of what God is doing in these people. You see, I believe... That the thing that is going to make our church launch into God's will for this community. I believe the thing that is going to help our church accomplish the mission that God has given us. Is not that I become a better preacher and I hope that I do. I believe the thing that God is calling us today to do. Is to recognize the fact that every person in this room. No matter how you feel about yourself. No matter what anybody has told you about yourself. No matter how you look. No matter what you think about you understand that God loves you and God wants to use you supernaturally that he has a plan and he has a purpose for you Christian do not be the pinky toe that derails the championship run you may think that what you do doesn't matter but listen as you look at me today and you hear me preach understand that this is only possible because there are 20 or so people in this building right now exercising their gifting so that we can have this here today. There are people all around this building today doing children's ministry, doing nursery, doing technology, greeting people, praying with people, keeping the building clean, making sure that we have security so that we're safe, making sure that they're doing the work necessary so that the lights can stay on. Church, you are needed. You are needed in God's kingdom. God loves you and wants to use you in his kingdom. You may not believe this right now. 
But your willingness to say yes to God, to be faithful and obedient to do what He's called you to do, may well result in the salvation of people you don't even know yet. You see, when we baptized that young lady last night, that wasn't just a victory for the preachers who preached. That was a victory for the givers who gave. That was a victory for the workers who worked. Now let me ask you this morning, is there something you can do? Are you willing to fold chairs? Are you willing to wipe off countertops? Are you willing to show up 10 minutes early and greet people as they come in? Maybe you're an introvert like me and you're like, heck no, I'm not willing to do that. Are you willing to work behind the scenes where nobody else sees you to make sure that we can get this service online? Are you willing to click a mouse button when BJ tells you which one to click? Are you willing to say yes when we tell you that there's a need? Are you willing to say yes to God when God presents you with the need? If you are willing to say yes to whatever God needs you to do, understand that on the other side of that will be the equipping and the gifting that you need to do it. God can use you and He wants to use you. And this morning we want to invite you into a church and into a Christian life that is not about talent, It's not about skill. It's not about ability. It's about availability. Pastor Herb Conley said it this way. Your best ability and my best ability is my availability. So I want to ask you this morning, Christian, are you available to God?